Hey guys, first of all, how are we feeling today? Good. I want to see that enthusiasm. I know it's nine o'clock and we don't want to be talking anything at all. But first of all, if I say cheer up, then we sh I just want to hear a loud noise. How are, you, how are you guys today? There you go. That's what I was, because I don't want to bore you, right? Yeah. So today my talk is going to be about GABA AI channels as therapeutic targets in glioblastoma. So I recently just finished my honors as well. So hoo hoo, uh, the thing is lifted. But uh, this is basically my honors project that I'm going to be further talking about. So as we all know, and most of the people might not, that glioblastoma is the most prevalent primary malignant brain tumor. Although rare, it exhibits high mortality and morbidity. So how the, what's the current standard of care is? The current standard of care consists of maximally safe surgical resection, which basically means that doctor tries to remove this, uh, the piece of tissue of the brain, uh, of the tumor tissue as much as possible, and which is further followed by the radiation and chemotherapy. However, the tumor reoccurrence is still very inevitable, which leads to a very poor prognosis with only five year survival period and which is less than 5% for the past two decades. So we know that we really need to do something about it, right? Brain cancer, a big problem, and where do we start it from? But you know what, what's the most disturbing thing about it is? It's its invasiveness. A significant feature of glioblastoma is in its invasiveness because that's, the, that's where those highly invasive tumor cells cause that dismal prognosis, therapy resistance, tumor, tumor reoccurrence, and you name it, what, what not, to be honest. And that's if, so if we develop those therapies, those which can target these highly invasive tumors that can improve the survivorship of the patient and decrease that disease progression, our goal is not to cure con cancer completely, but to improve the lives, uh, the survival lives of the patients and how we can do that, right? So, how do we approach that first of all? So it's very important to identify the potential therapeutic targets in these highly invasive tumor regions, all right? So this is basically a diagram of a glioblastoma brain tumor tissue in general, or as you can see over here. So this is how it starts. So I'm going from how it originates to outside. So this is the central tumor region, which further goes in towards the CT pan. Which, it, which we're not going to really talk about, but it goes towards IT infiltrating uh, leading edge and then towards the microvascular pro proliferation region, which is very much related to the uh, blood vessels and everything, whereas infiltrating and leading edge region that is associated with that normal brain parenchyma. So you might be wondering uh, why these regions? Because this, as I said, invasiveness, and this is the area that where this highly dismal prognosis um, Prognos uh, prognosis, tumor cells uh, reside, and that causes tumor reoccurrence and therapy resistance as well. Uh, so basically, if we target these tumor regions, that would be of really high noble uh, highly noble if you can develop therapies out of it as well. So what we did, right? Because this project I'm going to talk about will be very much translational as well, how you apply bioinformatics and then how you take it to the lab, right? So we, what we did was we took two data sets. One was AI-based mRNA gene signatures, and another one which was a RNA bulk sequencing data set from laser micro dissection experiments. Both the completely different techniques, right? And then what we did is we combined them. Further after that, what we did was obviously some analysis and more. We found the pathways and stuff. But since we, wa we want those drugs to target, we don't to target the proteins, not the gene transcripts. You can get great data, genes, transcript, but the drugs always target the protein. So you have to validate that data from the human protein outlets or other protein databases. And we did that. We found those further refined lists. Then we had to ex have to analyze the impact of these gene expressions on these population data sets, data sets, and we did on six different population data sets that combined 580 patients. And further with single cells, spatial transcriptomics and survival analysis, and I think I know everybody do that in cancer in general, if people are from cancer over here, uh, that list led to the identification of new genes to target the cancer cell invasion. 
So using this approach, what I did, I refined a potential list of new molecular targets of glioblastoma that are associated with highly invasive tumor regions and further search for the genes that mediate this cell-to-cell -cell communication. And you'll be like, Ashika, why cell-to-cell -cell communication? Why these membrane receptors? Because what we believe that is those highly invasive tumor cells, they interact with these membrane receptors and then further interact with that local tumor and microenvironment because in glioblastoma or in any cancer, we all talk about micro tumor microenvironment and they use these receptors to further uh, local uh, colonize away from the central tumor regions in different tumor regions that I was talking about as well. So what the particularly that we are interested in are the ion channels or these transporters. So these membrane receptors, they are further different types. One can be the ligand receptors that interact with non-malignant cell type and these ECM, and another can be the transporters. And another is ion channels that not only are involved in the processing of those ions, in the cell metabolism, but they're also involved in that electrical signaling with the surrounding neurons or neuronal-like cells uh, at the invasive front. So that's why we really got interested in that sort of things. So what's the summary of it as well? So what we did was when we take the, from two data sets, one was from, as I said, AI-based mRNA gene signature, or means, and the another one is Pochlowski data set, which consists of the, uh, laser micro dissection experiments and RLA bulk seq. So, if we try to find gene signature based on absolute gene expressions, uh, we know that we're not going to find the common gene signatures. So, we knew that if we try to see the biological processes that are involved in those those pathways, then we might be able to see that nobility. And we did saw some common pathways, as you can see over here. In leading edge, we found 14 of them. In infiltrating region, we found 15 of them. In CDMVP, we found 138 of them. And further, we map, map them back to the, these number of genes. And as you can see in the leading edge, which resides very, very closely with the brain paracarma, it lists like 550 of those genes. In inf infiltrating region, there are 35 of them, and CDMVP 323. Which further, and then I said, as I, as I was more interested in those uh, membrane receptors or cells to cell communication, right? Uh, we further looked for those genes using the Uniprot, and we found out that uh, these many numbers, like in the leading edge, as you can see, there are 20 ion channels in receptors as well, are 137 transporters are 71. But there, as you can see, they're very much in leading edge region, which re really made sense for us that yes, that is where that actually invasion stops. So first of, and then we, if we found out those amazing, beautiful lists of gene expressions, they might be completely utter trash, we don't know, right? We need to see them first, right? Um, so what we did was, this was spatial transcriptomics with Cytosyst. Uh, so I, I'm, I'll be able to love to talk about how Cytosyst and everything works. I just don't have time for that. I'm so sorry about that. But yeah, this, as you can see, it is a tissue that we, uh, that we take, up, take up from HNA. This is the normal brain paracarma. This is the, uh, where the brain tumor region is. So as you can see, what, what we got as well, and we, as we expected from the bioinformatic analysis as well, what we got in leading edge, these genes reside very well in that, at the start of the brain tumor region, right? In the infiltrating in the middle, and then CDMVP uh, later on after that in the further region. So we were like, yes, what we really got the results are actually true. They are not, not complete utter nonsense or something like that. So what next? So after that, as I said, we need to understand what's the impact of this gene expression, right, on the survival and on the survival of these patients. How these patients, how these genes are in relation with the survival. So we take six population data sets, and these were some of the very great results. As we were interested in ion channels and transporters, so. We threw them in, and this is the significance that we got. So anything we know that it's considered significant if it is more than 0 0.05, right? B value, great. But when in as a prognostic factor, the significant prognostic factor, it can be only considered if it's significant in more than two data sets or in two data sets or something like that. And if it is a positive prognostic factor, which means it is a favorable prognostic factor, if it has a hazard ratio of less than one, it is a 
poor prognostic factor if it has a hazard ratio of greater than one, which basically means when I talk about favorable prognostic factors, that they are lowly expressed in patients as compared to the normal, normal levels, and poor prognostic factor, basically, it is highly expressed, like SOX2 and anything like that, in patients as compared to the normal levels. And this is the refined list that we further got as well, uh, which is highly in the leading edge region, as you can see. So what later on what we found out, so these are the, we did the single cell analysis combining from two, uh, two different data sets as well. And we found out that the GABA genes, the GABA B1 and GABA C2, wholly highly present only in the tumor cells. Because in cancer, as I said, we really care about the tumor microenvironment. And most of the therapies fail because the other tumor microenvironment things are present. So if we have some things, if we have those genes, they're basically only in the tumor uh, cells they're expressed. And we found therapies out of that that will be extremely noble. Then further, as you guys might not know what GABA is, it's basically a receptor, which is basically uh, further categorized into GABA A and GABA B, uh, and GABA A is further off alpha, beta, gamma, and further subtypes. So this, as I said, it is highly present in the tumor cells. In the tumor cells, you can see GABA cheetah is highly over there. GABA cheetah is only in the tumor cells, and a little bit more, but highly in the tumor cells. And these are the survival analysis that you can see over there. They're lowly expressed. Uh, this basically means that, uh, as you can see, the hazard ratio is greater than one, which basically means when they're lowly expressed as compared to the normal levels, they are, uh, they are responsible for the poor prognosis, uh, for the basically the poor prognosis of the patient. So if we increase the activity of these channels rather than thinking by decreasing them, right, we can, by through some agonists or some other things, we can improve the uh, survival of the patients and they're present in the leading edge as well. So the hypothesis basically is if we activate these channels, it can attenuate the proliferation and reduce the tumor growth and prolong the further survival. And which I'm really going to go very swoop in because my time is gone uh, completely. Uh, these are the drugs that we found out that basically target the agonists that we're really interested in. But obviously, if they're agonists, they're probably going to be other conditions as well, like inhibitor or potentiators and stuff like that. What happens when you decrease their expression? What happens when you increase their activity? So these are the results that I further found out because in lab we work with organoids, uh, which is like tiny mini brains. And we did found out that there is a reduction by 30% on average by steripentol, which is one of our main agonists that we tested. And then further, there is significant cell, cell deaths induced by STP as well, which is steripentol. Um, and then there is induction of apoptosis that we could see as well. And there is high there is very less Chi67, which is a proliferative marker, and very decrease in proliferation as well. So these were the results that we got out that we know that the activation is highly responsible for this. And obviously, we need to treat on more things. And obviously, the other avenue will be the combinational therapies to go as well. And I hope you guys like the talk and I didn't bore you. I don't know why I didn't change that. The photo, I don't like that. But yeah. Um, yeah, thank you for the talk. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Ishika, for a very engaging talk. We've got time for one question. I bet I didn't say that great stuff. Okay, some question. Oh, no, the steps got it. Hi, nice talk. So in the heat map you have shown, there's also one gene APOE. And if I'm not mistaken, that's yeah. also a signature of some of the cancers. I mean, it's been eight years for me to work with cancer data, but mm -hmm. that the gene clicked my mind. So have you looked into the interaction of that APOE with other GABA receptors or what's yeah. your take on this? So the APOE is uh, the polyprotein E is the most, I would say, investigated protein in the history of cancer. It's generally talked about in Alzheimer's as well, dementia, but it's since so there's so much work done already on it, we chose not to do stuff on it. And also it was expressed in other, um, when we saw, I have not mentioned it, but in the Neftal subtypes, it was showing a very irregular type of data as well. So it was a way to just cut it off and not use it further. And I hope that answered your question about it. Yeah. Thank you.